All right. So there's a Star Wars joke in here, in case you didn't see it. It's told um, kind of how Empire Strikes Back. But so let me give some, some big picture comments, a couple of detailed uh, comments about some of the individual papers here. Uh, but I think this is, as you can tell from my discussion of Larry's and Dick's paper, I think this is a really exciting and important topic uh, to work on. And just to, to say this, the effort that went into this over the past decades uh, to get to this point uh, should not be underestimated and is just deeply impressive. So the fact that we're here now, uh, where we're talking about a, a, a market-based uh, pollution control system of this market uh, of this magnitude in China is, is astonishing. So if you would have asked me to bet 10 years ago that this was going to happen, I probably would have said unlikely. All right. So this is exciting. Uh, this is uh, the, the map is filling in for those of you who are not familiar with the World Bank's carbon price tracker system or what it's called. They track subnational, regional, and, and country level systems. So the map is finally filling in. So as an environmental economist. While domestic environmental policy is suffering some significant setbacks, looking at this map makes me feel better because it shows that what we, what we work on is really starting to, to gain uh, hold and we're seeing these systems and having this uh, right here being filled in is just truly uh, exciting. Uh, if you just think about the magnitude of the amount of carbon that we emitted into the atmosphere between the world's two leading emitters, this is the mountain of carbon, the integral across these, these time series right here tells you the total amount of carbon dioxide pumped into the atmosphere since the beginning of fossil fuel combustion is truly massive. So what China and the United States are going to do over the next 10 to 15 years is really significant. And it's exciting to do, see that at least one of the two uh, countries is doing something at the national uh, level. So where have we come from? Uh, for those of us in the room who've worked on this for, for a long time, we sort of started with this notion, what's, what's climate change, right? Why should we even worry? Then went on for a long time period in international negotiations where it always was this argument, well, it's a common but differentiated responsibility Right? You cost most of the emissions, meaning you, the, the high income countries, cost most of the emissions in the world. We recognize the problem, but you should uh, clean it up. So this wasn't just the, the, the PRC, this was a, a low income country at the time uh, argument, which then slowly through local pollution issues turned into very ambitious energy intensity targets in the PRC which, as we saw in the first presentation, then slowly translated into very significant carbon uh, intensity targets. And finally, in a moment that was uh, really historic, I still couldn't believe it when I opened the New York Times this morning, uh, not just a commitment on intensity targets by the PRC, which we've had before, right, in several five-year plans, but a commitment on overall emissions uh, levels. So what were we talking about there? This was the picture in the New York Times, where basically uh, China pledged a plan to have carbon dioxide emissions peak around 2030. It doesn't say how high the peak is going to be, right? It doesn't say at what rate it's going to decrease, and, and both of those numbers really matter when we worry about integrals. But a, a reversal in overall emissions is in the works. This program right now is the one that is largely going to get us there, with a number of, of, of other programs too. Now doing this, of course, is a, a significant challenge. Uh, this is a, a paper that Wolfram and I have. Is It's not like all the developments has happened in China. We've reached sort of peak comfort income, right? And now we can deal with the environment, uh, which is sort of this, I would argue, ludicrous environmental Kuznets curve argument right here. There's lots of development going on still, especially in the, in the rural sector, people adopting lots of energy consuming appliances. So we're doing this in the context of a country where large parts are still developing uh, rather rapidly. So, I'm not going to go uh, through all of these because I only have limited amounts of time, 
But a couple of people I've spoken to said, well, you know, in California we have a cap and trade system, it's a mass based system. What is this, you know, rate based uh, system here, this tradable performance standard? I think we should turn off the snark here. Uh, it's very important because if you look at California's system, what we're proposing here is we have, a, we have a price ceiling and a price floor in the system. So if the economy is booming, we're going to sell lots of permits at the price ceiling. So there's some flexibility to that uh, cap as well. So slow down, uh, California here. All right, so st I'm, I'm still excited about this system. So their flexibility in both systems uh, for when the economy is booming, I'm still in favor of a math-based system, which I'll get to, but you know, flexibility is there in, in both. Key here is the benchmarking is different, and the other important issue here is institutional, which for the sector that we're going to attack first is that electricity prices really aren't set by markets uh, instantaneously, but they're set by regulators, which is common in, in, in lots of developing countries and in, in China. So the other issue here, which is really interesting, is that provinces, they can't relax the benchmarks, but they can tighten them if they want to. So there's a one-time move here where if I'm a provincial regulator that has, for example, a really bad air pollution problem, I can try and tighten a benchmark on certain industries to address both the carbon uh, issue but also address other issues here. So this creates all kinds of interesting incentives for uh, local regulators to mess with these or change these, these benchmarks. So where we're going here is year one, uh, if the papers are right, which I think they are, we're going to design, spend most of the time designing EMNB uh, uh, procedures right here. Year two tests the system on the electricity sectors, and I'd like to understand better what we mean by testing. Uh, year three, we're going to run the system for the electricity system. Could be a couple more years, and then eventually we expand it to, to other sectors right here. So this is really fast, right? This is not, not sort of European California type timelines. This is like we're saying we're going to take a city's bus infrastructure and one year later all buses are electric, which is, you know, the way things are done uh, in, in China. So very quick uh, process. So this is the top line I stole from my son. What I got for Christmas is not what I asked for. Yes. All right. So in the classical environmental uh, economist like myself, would probably ask for a math-based system with really simple benchmarks, uh, permits being auctioned off, uh, and distributional <coughs> issues being dealt with transfers uh, from these auctioning uh, revenues. This particular neoclassical environmental economist would like a carbon tax, but I realize that that's never going to happen, so I'm going to stop whining about it until the very end. But the reality, I think, is that over the foreseeable future, we're going to get neither of those uh, things. And I think this is a simple political economy story here, which we in theory land often don't take uh, seriously enough when we talk about these particular uh, systems right here. So if you look back on China's environmental uh, policy history right here, there's a really long history of intensity targets, right? Intensity targets are something that regulators are familiar with, and they're comfortable with it because it allows for economic <laughs> growth, right? And it allows for uh, improving an environmental indicator, right? The problem, of course, being that emissions overall could go up still, even though your energy intensity is, is going down. Unfortunately, with a stock pollutant, the carbon doesn't, uh, the planet doesn't care about intensity. The carbon, uh, the planet cares about <coughs> overall emissions of, of CO2. So, this is a, a, a step forward. Uh, I think we should suggest improvements, uh, but uh, the key here now, I think, is let's just state that a mass-based system would probably be preferable but I think spend our efforts on trying to understand what the incentives of the currently proposed system are and suggest improvements to make sure that no major uh, surprises come out of the woods when this thing is, is being rolled out. 
So this is where I think Valerie's really nice paper, she's the only one that stayed within the page limit, so thank you. <laughs> so so uh, Valerie's very nice paper uh, came in here, is uh, when we think about emissions trading, right, we always think about sort of perfectly competitive markets, or we think about you know, electricity markets with some sort of market power at different levels of the, the supply chain right, uh, right here. But what we really haven't thought about very much is how do you do trading in a system where a significant share of the firms are owned by the state, right? So you could think of regulated utilities in, in the United States as not state-owned, but the state sort of has certain things to say about pricing, right? Prices aren't uh, really floating in, in electricity in California either. But I think what we've learned in the massive literature on how state-owned enterprises behave and the incentives they face and what this means in terms of how they're going to react to this new particular system here is there's a marriage of two literatures right here that I think is going to help us understand uh, what some of the potential pitfalls are that we're going to get from this particular system uh, going forward. And Valerie in her last slide pointed out a, a, a number of these that I don't think all of them were in the paper, so I would stick some of those uh, in there or make them more, uh, more up front. The thing that, that I would, hadn't thought about in, in great detail before here is this notion <coughs> that SOEs can, lower at, uh, can borrow at lower rates uh, than, than privately owned firms. So Valerie has this really nice argument in there that this leads to higher abatement by SOEs in a, in a simple uh, setting right here. I, the magnitude here is something that you know would be uh, interesting, uh, but it's a it's a it's an intellectually uh, interesting point. But the, the complexities here, which might lend themselves to some simulation modeling and certainly uh, more careful uh, thinking here, is the amount of heterogeneity across firms in terms of marginal abatement costs, emissions intensity, access to the capital, and how this is spatially distributed across China's provinces here can just lead to all kinds of interesting outcomes here uh, with these differential intensity targets. So we have some very simple theoretical predictions here, but I think how big any of these effects here are, uh, the simulation modelers in the room, I think there are some, some interesting papers to be written in here uh, that uh, would help us understand what the magnitudes of some of these effects uh, possibly uh, would be. The thing that I really worry about is state-owned enterprises, and I think three minutes I can do it. The, the thing here is uh, compliance and, and lying, right, are, are two topics that I think we should worry, worry about here, or, or truth-telling. Uh, the state-owned enterprises are used to complying to, to regulations. The private firms, it's not so clear, right? So this depends on the types of systems we develop for, for monitoring and, and, and verification right here. One of the most exciting uh, literatures to me in development and, and environmental economics is this uh, literature on uh, truth-telling uh, by, by auditors who mentioned uh, Esther and Michael Rodini and Nick's a very nice paper right here. But how we set incentives for the people going into these firms and trying to verify what actually happened on the ground is uh, something we're just much, much better and we understand much better than we did 10, 15 years ago. So I think uh, in terms of the, you know, if I had to hire some people or, or bring in some folks to help me design these systems, here are four names uh, right there that I think could help us greatly trying to design systems that make sure that we minimize uh, failure along this particular uh, dimension here. Uh, second, it's always hard to discuss four papers. I'm only going to discuss two and then wave my, my hands here. But the, the paper that was presented just now uh, is this notion of, of low carbon innovation. When we teach our undergraduate environmental economics classes, we always say these, you know, market-based systems lead to all kinds of innovation, and that's great And we draw that picture. Uh, we all know measuring that is really difficult, so I congratulate the authors on trying to do this for the, the pilot markets, but 
pattern count studies always made me kind of nervous, right? Because A, what are you measuring here? And B, there's sort of a time lag structure here where I'm worried about, you know, if you're going to do an event study here, like the authors do in this particular paper here, you're sort of assuming that these pilot markets come online and immediately patents appear. So you can do a little bit with lag structures, but if you have to do a three, four year lag structure, then you're getting into all kinds of sort of confounding uh, factor issues right here that make me a little bit itchy, I have to say. It's a nicely done paper. Uh, the data effort was really absolutely tremendous. The one thing I, I would say, I'm running out of time here, we've seen this picture already, uh, is I would play a little bit with, with lags here, right? And I would tone down this notion that you're estimating a causal effect here, right? There's a nice correlation that's being estimated here, but the causality is a, a tough statement to do, especially when you're going forward and sort of extrapolating and saying, you know, this uh, system will lead to a 1.8% decrease in, in carbon intensity or something like this due to innovation. The standard errors around that number are large, large, and I'd be worried about, you know, taking these numbers uh, too, too seriously. But the results are encouraging. The, the coefficient uh, signs and magnitudes are, are reasonable but I would just tone it down a, a little bit. So, what these four papers left me with is excitement to work in this particular space.